Amen. The word of God that comes to us this morning is from two passages in the scriptures, one from 2 Kings and then from the book of Jonah. So let's turn first to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 14 and verses 23 through 29. It's on page 321 of the Pew Bible there. 2 Kings chapter 14 and beginning in verse 23. In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned forty-one years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah. According to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer. For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left, bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, so he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all that he did in his might, how he fought and how he restored Damascus and Hamath to Judah in Israel, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Jeroboam slept with his fathers, the kings of Israel, and Zechariah his son reigned in his place. And then over to Jonah. Jonah chapter 1. Uh, and uh, we're going to read just verses 1 through 3. It also can be found there on page 774 in the Pew Bible. Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he, he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. So ends the reading of God's word this morning. Shall we pray together and ask his blessing upon that word as it comes to us? Again, O oh God and Heavenly Father, we come to you. And we bless and praise you for giving us your word. And we pray, O oh God, that you would grant that we might receive it with your blessing. Would you come by your spirit and enlighten our minds to understand it? We pray that through it, that you might shine upon us. Be for us this morning, we pray, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, leading us on the paths of true faith and obedience by your marvelous grace and that one who is the light of the world, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. This sermon this morning is an effort to uh, give us a good introduction to the book of Jonah. I'm going to be preaching through the book. We're not going to jump right into the text so much this morning. I was hoping we would be getting into, into it sooner. The Lord had other plans, bringing us a storm, and then with the holidays, we'll take a bit of a break. But I thought it would be good, rather than jumping right into the text the way Jonah was tossed into the waves of that raging sea, good for us in more of something of an introductory fashion to consider the message of the book. We might think, what a simple message. Even the children here know what the book of Jonah is about. It's about that disobedient prophet who ran away from the Lord and had to be tossed into the sea and be swallowed by that big fish and then was saved so that he could go forth and preach to the people of Nineveh and that they might repent. Marvelous, in many ways, simple story indeed. In fact, in many ways, it's not so simple. Read a bunch of different theologians and you might find yourself kind of like I was, feeling like I was being tossed around, uh, about amidst the, the waves of the stormy sea of interpretations. That can be discouraging. You think you read, a tech or read a good commentary and think, boy, I missed it. I didn't understand the book at all. Humiliating. Well, that's not necessarily such a bad thing. Sometimes the many 
different emphases and wonderful truths with which God's word is so filled can be complex and sometimes we miss things and we should not be discouraged this morning. For example, if we hear a, a portion of God's word preached or taught in a manner a bit different or with something of a bit of a different interpretation perhaps than that which we understood or, or even taught our family. Hopefully we're leading our family in uh, understanding God's word through family worship. As we commit ourselves to the word of God, God is going to bless our efforts and build us up, build up our families, build up our congregations in his marvelous truth, even despite our imperfections. We are all growing together, growing in our understanding. And Jonah reminds us that the Lord is so patient, so full of compassion as we are all ever growing and learning new things, learning of his ways so that we might better be able to make his compassionate ways known to others. In fact, as we launch into the book, that brings me this morning to what I want to suggest as a simple theme for the book of Jonah. It has complexities, but I offer this very simple and general theme, which I hope will be helpful. And here it is, that the Lord calls us, his people, to learn of and be transformed according to his great compassion and so be eager to make it known to others. This morning, I hope that we shall see this as we see it demonstrated, even as we take up some of the uh, introductory questions about the book's author, date, occasion, background, what kind of biblical writing it is, and so forth. So first, let's take up the question of the author. Who wrote the book of Jonah? I take the position that it was Jonah who wrote the book that bears his name. The name Jonah, by the way, actually means dove, the very same word that we see used in Hosea chapter 7, verse 11, to describe Israel. It says this about Ephraim. Ephraim represents Israel. It says, Ephraim is like a dove, silly and without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. Interestingly, it says going to Assyria. Israel was, was condemned for entering into forbidden alliances, trusting in great nations like Egypt and Assyria rather than trusting in the Lord and, and living as a testimony to his greatness by trusting in him alone. Anyway, for now, I'm suggesting that this, this prophet who lived up to his name as a dove-like, something of a silly and senseless individual, he's the very one who wrote the book that bears his name. Uh, many liberal scholars would argue against this. Sadly, there are many who would have us believe not only that Jonah never wrote the book, but that there never was any prophet named Jonah who went to Nineveh at all. They would argue that the whole story is fictional, invented, made up. If you would like to look with me in your Bibles this morning at Matthew chapter 12, we'll see how the words of our Lord quickly settle this matter for us. And I want us to see this morning how for more than one reason, this is a a marvelous text upon which to meditate together as we launch into the book of Jonah. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 41. For now, let us note that clearly uh, here Jesus affirmed the historicity of these Jonah events. In fact, notice how he offers them their truth as a basis upon which he warns the unbelieving scribes and Pharisees of his day. Matthew chapter 12 verse 41 says this. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Our Lord is not a liar. He clearly affirmed the truth that there was a real prophet named Jonah who went and preached to real Ninevites. And, and one day, brothers and sisters, in real history, they will rise up at the judgment with Christ and they will condemn those who refused to recognize but who instead opposed him who was the greater than Jonah who had, had now come and was in their midst. So the book of Jonah was about real Ninevites and about a real prophet. I will not suggest this morning that if you disagree that Jonah wrote the book that that makes you a liberal or makes you necessarily someone who does not believe the story or does not believe the historicity of the Bible in general. 
You may have noticed that the text does not explicitly state that Jonah wrote the book. It, it is possible that he carried out his ministry in Nineveh and then returned to Israel. His story became known, but that it was some time later that the Spirit inspired another individual to write about his story. In a minute, we will talk a little bit about the dating of the book. But personally, I find it strange to suggest that Jonah himself would not have been the author and since it was believed historically he was the author and we have find no compelling reason to think otherwise, I think it best for us to simply affirm that Jonah was the author. And in fact, this morning it strikes me as wonderfully fitting that in God's wisdom it would be Jonah himself who should be the author. For one reason, in some ways it's kind of like the disciples of Jesus writing the Gospels. One of the things that makes their writings, their testimony so believable is the way that they present themselves in such a negative light. If their, their message were not true but simply made up stories, why would they make up stories in which in, in so many instances they are presented as men of such weak faith, so slow in understanding, given to bickering among themselves? Why would they make up a story in which they behaved as such cowards, forsaking their Lord? Well, we know the answer. They did not make it up. It was all true, wonderfully true, and telling the wonderful truth, even the humiliating truth about themselves, would serve to exalt Christ. And the story of Jonah exalts not Jonah the prophet, but exalts the Lord, the God of Israel. Jonah is presented in a terrible light. We will see how the book will end with him angry and arguing with the Lord, and yet I submit that Jonah wrote it down for us, and I submit that this supports its credibility as that which we know it is this morning, the true word of God. And there's another reason that I think that the book of Jonah should encourage us, this in connection with the theme which I've suggested, that the, the, the book of Jonah will call us to learn of and be transformed according to the compassion of the Lord. Learn of God's compassion. Think about it this morning, brothers and sisters. If Jonah wrote the book, then is that not a good indication that he learned something of the Lord's compassion, the Lord's patience and kindness to him? This idea, I'll mention by the way, this idea of Jonah being a book about the prophet's need to learn was not my own idea, suggested by a theologian by the name of Walter Moberly. There are significant areas where I would not agree with with this particular individual, such uh, issues relating to the historicity of the book of, of, of Jonah and so forth. But I found very helpful this one point in his Old Testament theology, which he gave, uh, which, which uh, he wrote and gave the, ch uh, the chapter on Jonah, he gave the title, Educating Jonah. He writes these words, <clears throat> readers can suppose that they understand a text when in reality their grasp is partial and perhaps seriously impaired. Uh, he gives an example from Jesus' own day. Remember how our Lord was condemned by the religious leaders for eating and drinking with sinners. And do you remember what Jesus said to them? They came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. But do you remember he quoted a, a scripture text? Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, he said, Go and learn, go and learn what this means I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. He, he cited there Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That must have been such a well-known text. Probably the religious leaders could have uh, quoted that from memory. And yet here Jesus was suggesting that they needed to go and learn what it meant what a sad indictment, powerful word of rebuke. And yet I would submit to you that we need to hear that this morning, don't we? That you and I also need at times really to hear our, word, our, our Lord say to us in so many words, you do not know what it means that the Lord desires mercy. You need to learn. Every time we sin, every time we fail to act compassionate and loving to our spouses and to our children and to our neighbors, we remind ourselves, we're reminded that our sanctification is not yet complete, that we have not sufficiently learned, or more than that, we have not, we have not lived according to those things that we have 
learned. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, when he was calling the, the believers, particularly the believers in Ephesus, to live the new life in Christ and was contrasting that new life with the old life of sin, he wrote in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 20, but that is not the way that you learned Christ. In some ways, it's like parents telling their children, you know better than that. Have you heard those words, children? You know better than that. In some ways, that is what the Lord tells Jonah at the end of the book. It, it concludes with something of a rhetorical question, a question inviting no response, a question which makes such a powerful point. Jonah chapter 4, verse 11, the Lord asks, and should not I pity Nineveh? It's like God is saying, Jonah, this is a teaching moment. Don't even attempt to answer the question. Chew on it, mull it over. You know better than your attitude and your conduct would suggest. You know my character as the Lord whose steadfast love endures forever. You know that my compassion is so great that it should be overflowing and, and pouring out to the nations and that should affect your feelings about and your conduct towards the nations. And this morning, loved ones, insofar as you and I often fail to live according to the Lord's great compassion, we should rightly feel that rhetorical question word of reproof, of reproof directed, directly, uh, directed at us. But you see my point here. Jonah may have been angry at the end of the, the narrative, the telling of his story, but here the spirit, it seems, continued to work in him and even inspire him to write this book, and that should encourage us, I think, this morning with, with, with regards to the Lord's compassion and his patience. The Lord did not give up, it seems, on the slow learning prophet. And brothers and sisters, he does not give up on you and on me this morning as we are being sanctified, sometimes painfully, slowly learning what Jonah had to learn, learning what he wrote down for us so many hundreds of years ago. Well, that brings us this morning to the second question. When was the book of Jonah written? In some ways, I've already answered the question. If Jonah wrote the book, then it was written around the middle of the eighth century BC. Imagine that, some 900 years before Jesus came. Again, that is not what you're likely to learn if you simply Go on the internet and Google the question, who wrote Jonah? When was the book of Jonah written? Probably not, in general, a safe way to do theology or biblical studies, necessarily. <laughs> not without great discernment. Good chance you might read that the answer would be probably in the 4th or 5th century BC, during the post-exilic period, the period after the people of Israel had been scattered among the nations, obviously by someone besides Jonah, because Jonah was long since dead by then. A common view is that it was a book written in order to counter the Jewish nationalism, the idea that we're the, we're the only true nation and we'll look down on and, and, and reject other nations, the Jewish nationalism in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. This view holds that Jonah's message was a message intended to oppose the xenophobia, right? The, the dislike of foreigners, the bigotry of those Jews who returned from exile. I mean, after all, the argument goes, those guys, they were putting away their foreign wives and they were excluding anyone who wasn't a Jew from entering into the temple and so forth. Jonah had to be written with a view, a positive view towards foreigners, foreigners in order to counter this attitude of exclusivism among the Jewish people. Of course, I disagree with the later dating of the book. More importantly, I, I disagree with the basis for it, which is really a misunderstanding of what we do read in the book, books of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Such thinking can often reflect a very low view of scripture, can't it? I will say this, however, this morning. I think that we should find it helpful and edifying to note ways in which God's purpose was to have this message that would speak so powerfully to the covenant community, not only of Jonah's day, but even beyond his day, particularly, yes, to the exile and the post-exilic generations. All of this, of course, because God intended to have one message that was one marvelous story about Christ Jesus. 
when we think, remember the exile, we should always remember that Jesus, he was the one that was sent into exile, wasn't he? He had to leave his home in heaven and go and dwell in a foreign land where he suffered there for our sins. Praise God for that this morning. Of course, jo Jonah will point us to the work of Christ and that his experience in the belly of the great fish will serve as something a, of a sign of Christ and his cross and his three days in the tomb and then his resurrection, the sign of Jonah. But it is interesting to think about this exile community emphasis. We see it even in words of conservative theologians like E.J. Young, who wrote this in his introduction to the Old Testament as he was uh, talking about the purpose of the book of Jonah. Helpful words, you'll hear me uh, refer to these more than once as I preach through Jonah. He wrote this, the experience of Jonah had great didactic value, great teaching value for the Israelites of his day, but then he goes on to say, Jonah, an Israelite, was cast into the sea and delivered in order that he might fulfill his mission. So the nation, because of its disobedience, would have to pass through the waters of affliction that a remnant might return to accomplish Israel's mission in the world. Clearly, there's a reference to the exile there, isn't there? Uh, Young affirms that the message was spoken for the benefit of Jonah's people in his own day, but he also sees Jonah's experience in the fish as being something of, of, of typological, symbolic of the covenant people, the way they would be sent into exile. They would have to become, you see, like the disobedient prophet. They would have to be tossed in, as it were, tossed into the sea and, and swallowed up in the judgment of the exile. And it would happen so that they might be able then to fulfill their mission. We will think much about that together. Let me simply say this for now with, with E.J. Young. I believe we are correct in affirming an earlier date, but that we should also appreciate in Jonah how God's powerful word would, would transcend time and by the, the power of the Spirit speak to his people in every generation and this should encourage us this morning with that expectation we ought always to have when we hear his word read that God is going to come and he's going to speak his word to us we see the power of his word as it goes forth among the Ninevites and we remember then how the Lord then inspired Jonah to proclaim proclaim that word yes to the people of his day but also to write it down for them and for future generations to write it down for us as we are so blessed to consider it together. This should move us to, to, to worship and praise of the Lord for his word. Part of the value of an introduction to a book where we kind of step back and think about how that book has come to us is, is to think what a marvelous way in which God has inspired every portion of his word and brought it to us. We are so blessed. I think it is helpful uh, and important to consider Jonah in its canonical context. Wh in which part of the Bible did this book end up? It was part of the book of the 12, or the 12 minor prophets. I don't know if we all realize at one point those 12 minor prophets were all written onto one scroll. They were believed to have one, one unified message. One, they, they served as one literary unit. And I think that is true, even though, for example, Jonah was written much earlier than was Haggai, for example. <clears throat> I believe that all of this was by God's design. And in future weeks, we'll look at Jonah a little bit and how it fits into that message of the minor prophets. We praise God for the way that, that the Lord worked to ensure that we have the Bible such as it is and that Jonah is part of that inspired word. What a beautiful word. What a beautiful word word that God has given to us and we should step back and, and, and marvel at, at its glory and its beauty. But we do so not simply as those who are enjoying a piece of art or maybe a great piece of literature for those who are fans of literature. We ought to see the word of God as like a sword piercing our souls, breaking our hearts unto Christ. And so be reminded this morning of the words we hear in James chapter one and, and, and meditate upon this, these as we think about opening up a book like Jonah. James wrote, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. 
for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. May God help us as we look to the book of Jonah to be not only hearers, but doers of the book of Jonah. And just think as we do that, by God's grace, then we are being faithful prophets. Think about that. Jonah prophesied 900 years before Jesus so that we might live as prophets of the Lord today, not in the sense that we hold the, the office of the prophet, of course, but so that we might live our lives, as it were, proclaiming in the way that we live, in the way that we speak the word of the Lord. Dr. Don Collett is a seminary professor, happens to be an old class, class, classmate of mine in seminary and a friend of mine. He suggests that the question that the, the question with which the book of Jonah challenges us, the question which, with, with which it ends and challenges us is this. Which Jonah will you be? We will learn that Jonah is kind of a complex individual. One, one moment running away from the Lord, one moment praising the Lord and eager to go to Nineveh, and then he's arguing with the Lord and angry with the Lord. And he's, he's a complex individual. And so which, which Jonah are you? No, the question is which Jonah will you be? Which Jonah will I be? Will you be one who continues to resist your prophetic identity? Or will you be as one who in Christ has been crucified and been raised to new life and thereby will you be ready to, to go and preach? Preach to Nineveh, as it were. Will you be one willing, eager to, to live, testifying before the nations of the great compassion of the Lord? Will you abandon your pro prophetic identity and run away from the Lord, angry with the Lord, like the Jonah we see in our text this morning? or in Christ? Will you embrace your prophetic identity? May God help us to learn from Jonah and live by the word and adorn its message. And so let our lights shine before men. Such must be our response to the word if we understand the Lord's great compassion, the Lord's great salvation. And that brings us to the third thing I want us to see this morning as we, we consider the message in its background. We speak of purpose, occasion, background of a book of the Bible. We've touched on the purpose a bit and even said a bit about Jonah's message to future generations. But I want us to look back at his own time period and I'm gonna read from the scripture here. And I want us to, 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 to see how Jonah was a prophet who with his people had witnessed firsthand the saving grace of God to unworthy sinners. So if you'd like to turn your Bibles with me, I'm going to read from 2 Kings again. We already looked at chapter 14. I want us to look at chapter 13 a bit, as well as chapter 14. I'm going to do a fair bit of reading here, so let's put on our, th our uh, list, uh, thinking caps and follow along. Jonah prophesied in Israel the northern kingdom in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, who, re, who uh, lived from 782 to about 753 BC. Now the grandfather of Jeroboam was Jehoahaz. And look at 2 Kings chapter 13. Here's what we read about Jehoahaz, beginning in verse one. It says this. In the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, and he reigned 17 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He did not depart from them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them continually into the hand of Hazael, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of of Haziel. You can keep your finger there, but we see that, that Israel was continuing in wicked Jeroboam's sin. They were rightly suffering under the judgment of the Lord because of their sin. But note what we see in verse 4. Then Jehoahaz sought the favor of the Lord, and the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, how the king of Syria oppressed them. 
Now look at verse 5. Therefore the Lord gave Israel a savior so that they escaped from the hand of the Syrians and the people of Israel lived in their homes as formerly. We're going to read more. You can keep your finger there. But you see that the, that the Lord saw Israel suffering and he, he did what? He had compassion upon them. He gave them a savior, a savior to deliver them from the Syrians. Who was the savior? This is interesting. The savior was likely, likely this is a reference to Assyria. And we remember that the capital of Assyria was Nineveh. Syria was north of Israel. Assyria was further north and east. Assyria became a savior for Israel and that they became a threat to the Syrians who were oppressing the people of Israel. The Assyrians came and they forced the, the, Assy the Syrians to turn their attention away from Israel. So in the Lord's compassion, he gave Israel a savior from the Assyrians. And yet verse 6 tells us, as we go on, it says, Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin, but walked in them, and the Asherah also remained in Samaria. Now it goes on to talk about the, the way that the people had, had suffered under the oppressions, uh, under the oppression of the Syrians. Uh, Jing, uh, King Jehoahaz finally died and was replaced by his son Joash, who was also evil. Interestingly, the narrative then takes up the death of Eli uh, Elisha. Uh, fascinating, beautiful events there. We may want to look at those a little bit because it's very possible, likely, that, that Jonah, as a young boy, witnessed the prophecy of Elisha, who was prophesying in Israel. At any rate, the, the narrative then reverts to the life of Jehoahaz in verse 22. I'm going to read again there in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 22. It says this, Now Hazael, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz. Now look at this in verse 23. But the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion on them, and he turned toward them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them, nor has he cast them from his presence until now. Do you see how the text is just filled with the compassion of the Lord? And now we turn over to the text which we already read, chapter 14. Look, look again with me at verses 23 and following of 2 Kings chapter 14. It says, In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, or Jehoash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he re reigned 41 years, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. Keep your finger there still. But notice how we see that, that, that Jonah, Jonah was prophesying there during a time of widespread apostasy. That is, by and large, the people turned away from the faith in and worship of the Lord, the God of Israel. And yet the Lord was so kind that it goes on to say in verse 25, it says, he restored the border of Israel from Limo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel. I hope you caught this earlier. Here it is. Which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Hefer. And then verse 26, for the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left, bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven. So, note this again. I hope you saw it earlier. He saved them. He saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. I'm belaboring the point for us this morning, but what a glorious Point. Wow. Do you see how in the, the generations leading up to the days of King Jeroboam II, the Lord showed his compassion to this people despite such continued amazing wickedness. Jeroboam led the people into continued apostasy. He followed the sins of the first Jeroboam, and yet he became the instrument of salvation, just as Assyria had become an instrument of salvation. And all of this happened, it says, according to the word of Jonah. Yes, Jonah had seen. Yes, 
Jonah should have known better. Jonah and the covenant people, Israel, whom he represents, they should have known of the Lord's great compassion for sinners. They should have gladly embraced their prophetic identity. They should have been eager to serve as his instruments of compassion among the nations. They failed. They failed and we failed. Israel at its worst pictures for you and me exactly what we are by nature, sinners. They failed, we failed, we all need a savior and praise God that he sent that greater than Jonah, Messiah of whose work Jonah was a sign so that we crucified and, and raised up to new life in him might go forth and proclaim his grace and his compassion. When we step back and think about the word of God and we're reminded that God chose these people, these Israelites, this Jonah, these terrible sinners to, to, to bring into the world the savior and to bring such a wonderful salvation. We marvel at his grace, his compassion, his salvation among the peoples. We marvel at such a beautiful story. And that brings us this morning, lastly, and briefly, we're going to conclude by saying a little bit about the, the, the what, what, what type of writing, biblical writing, we speak of the word genre, G-E-N-R-E. What kind of literary composition? In some ways, well, it's enough to simply say what the children can tell us. Jonah is a story, a story about the prophet who was swallowed up by the fish. But we categorize biblical writings. One common category, of course, is prophecy, where the prophet speaks. He speaks of visions. He pronounces oracles, messages given to him by the Lord. Another category is historical narrative, the, the narrating, that is the telling the story of the events of history, like First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. Well, where does Jonah fit in? What kind of category would he be in? He was kind of a combination, isn't he? He's one of the prophets who speaks by telling his story. In fact, we note that Jonah writes about himself not in the first person, the Lord said to me, uh, he speaks of himself in the third person. The word of the Lord came to him. He follows in the footsteps of the great prophet Moses. Moses wrote the five books of Moses in the third person, referring to himself as him. And so Jonah has been categorized as, here's a, a fancy term, prophetic narrative. The prophet speaking the word of the Lord by recounting historical events, events or telling a true story. In this case, Jonah speaks God's word, narrating these amazing historical events which occurred in his own life. For the most part, Jonah is all prophetic narrative. An exception is when we get to chapter 2, which is more like something of a, of a psalm, isn't it? But other examples of prophetical narrative are the stories about the prophets of Elijah and Elisha, where much of their message comes through the stories of their lives, often extraordinary events, miraculous events. And ultimately, of course, we know this morning that it is true with all of Scripture, whether in words like, thus saith the Lord, or through the telling of a story, God is speaking to us. Meditate on that wonderful thought this morning, brothers and sisters. God has spoken. The Lord speaks not with mere words, but through the wonderful story, through the glorious revelation, that story of what he has done in Christ Jesus. His word is most profoundly spoken through the historical events of his life and his death and his resurrection, God's great salvation in him. Yes, children are right, such a simple story about a prophet who was swallowed by a fish, but it's more than that. It's God's great story by which he calls sinners out of their sins and into fellowship with himself through the great Christ event. We can say this morning that Jesus is our prophetic narrative. By God's grace, through his powerful word, by the Spirit, his story has become our story. That was true of Jonah and the Ninevites to whom he prophesied, and it is true of you and me this morning, if our trust 
is in Christ Jesus. And we can see this as I conclude by simply referring us back to the words of our Lord in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 41, where Jesus said that the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. It's a powerful warning for those to whom God's word does not bring about repentance and faith. But what wonderful encouragement as we launch into this book, what wonderful encouragement for us this morning. Here our Lord affirmed his identity, his oneness, his union with the people of Nineveh. Nineveh. Those ones that repented at the preaching of Jonah, they will be part of, they will participate in the revelation of my glory on the last day. This is our eschatological hope, isn't it? Our great hope for the end of time that we will be there standing with those ones, standing with God's people on the last day. And so, yes, with all of Jonah's complexities and interpretation, we, we might feel at times like we're being tossed around in the sea a little bit. More than that, the work of sanctification is painful at times. How could it not be? We learned earlier that that old you, that old me, has to be crucified and put to death. The old you and me, the old you and me, which is like Jonah at his worst, running away from the presence of the Lord, has to be sought out and brought back again and again again. And again, that one who, like the religious leaders who are opposing Jesus, that one must be put to death. But praise God that, that, that we will not be condemned on the last day because in Christ, as we heard earlier, that old one, that old man, that old woman, the old you was crucified, condemned and crucified in Christ. But that one must be put to death. That will be painful at times as we interact with the word of God. We're going to, we, 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 we should expect to feel like seaweed is wrapped around our heads and we're sinking down into the depths of the sea. So may Jonah's prophecy move us afresh to repentance and faith. But that happens in the context of such wonderful hope, does it not? In view of God's great compassion, through the prophetic narrative, the Lord calls us his people to learn of and be transformed according to his great compassion and so be eager to make it known to others. To ourselves as individuals, let us remind ourselves of meditating much together upon the, the, the compassion of the Lord. To our families, to our church, as the Lord gives us opportunity to our, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, our classmates, wherever it is that in God's providence he's sending us out among the nations. Let us be those who proclaim the great compassion of our God. Let us learn from Jonah and from the people of Nineveh. And so let us learn from Christ as more and more we are conformed unto his image until that wonderful day in which we will rise up with the people of Nineveh. And there we shall behold the face of him, the greater than Jonah, and we shall be at last with them conformed perfectly unto his image in glory. What a great salvation. What a compassionate Lord. Let us pray. How blessed we are, O Lord God, to be able to say with your people of old, no, to say it with greater understanding of your great compassion and mercy, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. How we praise you for speaking to your people of old through the prophets, and as those who now receive that word through the mediation of that one who is, has come and been crucified and raised from the dead. We pray, Lord God, that you might bless us. We magnify your great name. Uh, we can say that indeed you have revealed your, uh, your righteousness in the sight of the nations, that your salvation has reached the ends of the, uh, the earth. And so, Lord, we pray that as we open up the pages of Jonah, that you might open up our hearts. God, full of compassion, grant to us to know and be transformed by that compassion and to show it forth in our lives. Hear us and bless us, O oh, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.